This is the R Podcast, Episode 10, Adventures in Data Munging, Part 2. Welcome back to the R Podcast. This is Eric Nance, and I'm the host of the podcast, and we have made it to episode 10. 10 is always kind of a nice, round, decent number, and um, it's certainly been a great experience to get to this point, and I'm really looking forward to what we have in store in the future. So in this episode, I'm going to continue um, talking about some of my... Um, adventures and learning from data munging with respect to some real um, NHL data that we started looking at back in the last episode. And I'll be specifically talking about my experience with scraping some data from online, which is actually becoming a very common these days with, of course, the added availability of data, you know, within the internet and within various pages. And the nice thing that R gives us is really easy ways of getting this data imported directly into our data sets for further analysis. So we'll be talking extensively about what I've learned from that. So before we start, I wanted to share some kind of preliminary items before the main topic. First of which is that with this episode, episode 10, this will be the um, last episode of our first season of the R podcast. Now, some of you may be wondering, where did seasons come from? Well, I didn't really have it in mind when I first started, but I figured now that we've made it to 10 episodes, I kind of think it might be nice to break these up into different seasons of, say, 10 episodes each, where, you know, this first season, it was really getting to the basics of R itself, and we just touched on recently some really innovative things we could do from respect of, say, visualization and what we're doing now with, you know, processing data. And so after this episode, with the next episode, we'll mark uh, season two. And I have a lot of ideas I want to explore, you know, in the near future. And they'll just kind of give me a nice uh, kind of break point to put all those in motion. So uh, now, don't worry out there. I'm not going to be taking an extended hiatus, although admittedly these past few episodes have not gotten out as often as I've intended. But, you know, sometimes life happens. A lot of things kind of take, take, up, take up time for us. But anyway, the next season should be starting relatively shortly. And I'm look, really looking forward to sharing some of the exciting ideas I have in store with respect to the podcast. Um, and then the other items I wanted to touch on are just a couple of kind of news items with respect to the R uh, community. Uh, first of which is actually going to delve into the um, IDE called R Studio that I've been talking about in previous episodes. And the big news item that came out a few weeks ago was that the R Studio team has brought forth uh, a very, um, you know, exciting trio of R. Um, community members, actually our developers, you might say, of, of add-on packages. Mainly, they brought on board Hadley Wickham, Winston Chang, and uh, Garrett Gerhardt um, to the pod, to the uh, R Studio team. And this news just kind of came out of nowhere when I saw it on the blogs. But um, obviously, if you're going to get some people to join the team, those are, those are some excellent uh, members to join because... A lot of you are quite familiar, I'm sure, with Hadley Wickham's work where, you know, we've talked about the ggplot2 package extensively in a previous episode, and Hadley's done a lot more in respect to these um, very innovative packages from even a processing standpoint, uh, working with other types of data as well. And, you know, I really admire his work and, you know, can't get enough of whatever packages he develops. And, um... Winston, Winston Chang has been um, very instrumental in the ggplot2 development as well. And I've been reading some of his work lately, and it's really well done. And Garrett's also the author 
of the uh, very um, nice package called Lubridate, which actually makes working with dates and times in R a heck of a lot easier than just by the default. I've actually used this package on some projects recently and it really made things a lot easier with getting kind of some date time variables in nice formats. And so I'm really looking forward to what our studio has in store with, with these, uh, these really brilliant minds that have joined the team. So we'll have to kind of stay tuned together on that one. Then the last um, item I want to touch on was that also recently there was a milestone within the community itself in the R project and that now there are over 4,000 packages available for R. So that's that's just a huge number. And I remember when I first started the podcast, we were over 3,000, I believe. And I even thought then, you know, what a what a large number we have for packages. And now we've already gone another 1,000 above that. So it's really um, shows you just how popular and how innovative R is and the kind of statistical computing community. So really looking forward to that number even, of course, getting bigger and bigger as we go on. So with that, um, let's dive into the main topic for today, Adventures in Data Munging, part two. All right, everybody, so last episode, I discussed, you know, getting some real NHL data that was stored on via, say, flat text files from a project called the Hockey Summary Project. And if you haven't listened to that, you know, that was, I would recommend you listen to that episode as well, since obviously it was the first in this series, because that really touched on some neat concepts that sometimes we have to get dirty so to speak with the data we import with respect to dealing with messy values you know incomplete data and things of that nature so i touch on some of the things i experienced from that front and you know as i was you know developing the code to import that data and i was just kind of reading through kind of some other sports blogs and things like that but then ironically I was uh, appointed from one of the blogs about R to a roundup of the recent Use R conference that took place. And what I noticed is that someone had a post the, from a slide set they did on importing, you know, Major League Baseball data from an online source. So I thought, oh, that sounds kind of interesting. Just kind of see what that's about. and. The, the author of that uh, slide deck, which I'll have a, a link in the show notes, um, really did a nice job of detailing, you know, what site, what kind of data was on the site and how they went about importing that data directly into R. And the site in particular kind of caught my, caught my attention because it was called like baseballreference.com. And I was thinking to myself, boy, it sure would be nice if they had some hockey data too. So I decided to just check out the site, and then lo and behold, when I checked on kind of the links stored in that site, sure enough, I saw a sister site called HockeyReference.com. So I was thinking, oh, this, this looks promising. So I went ahead and took a look, and sure enough, they have some really nice collection of all types of hockey data, whether it's you know data on the games themselves via what we call box scores, whether it was season kind of statistics summarized for each team and also each player even some data corresponding to like you know players being drafted into the league and just all sorts of nice nice tables online and a very kind of logical structure for how the links were constructed which i'll touch on as we go on here so i thought to myself okay let's see if i can get this data in and perhaps combine it with the existing data that I've taken from the um, Hockey Summary Project. Because one thing I did notice is that the HockeyReference.com site had, you know, a good chunk of data, but it didn't have quite everything that the uh, Hockey Summary Project had. But with that said, the one advantage, the other advantages that I saw was how clean the data was. And that if I could just import these tables effectively, I would have a really nice clean set to start with for my actual analysis of hockey data. 
So I kind of took some of the techniques that were outlined from this um, USAR 2012 presentation with respect to the baseball data and tried to adapt the kind of methodologies to um, take this hockey data from this site as well. So now we're, we're right at the crux of it. How do we import data that's stored on these various, you know, table type uh, environments within a web page? Well, the good news is, is that R has a very innovative package, a very um, important package for this purpose. And that package is called XML. That's all capital letters, by the way. And once again, we'll have a link to the CRAM page for this package in the show notes. But this package actually has a very important function to take um, these kind of data, and it's called read HTML table. So what's nice about this is that they kind of structured it to be similar to when we use a function in R to import, say, a text file with data. We talked about in previous episodes about things like read.table, read.csv to import a comma-separated value file. So this read HTML table function is along those same lines. And what's nice is that it will, once you supply into it the URL to basically that has the data, it's going to give you back a list and with each component of the list being a data frame corresponding to the tables that were on that, that actual page. And that's kind of a key default behavior is that it will take any and all of those HTML tables on the web page, which may be good, maybe not so good, depending on what kind of tables are on there. Because in my experience, all these web pages will have some tables that are really just, in essence, nonsense versus the ones that are actually having the data you're looking for. So that's one thing to keep in mind that by default, it's going to take everything. But some other arguments that I wanted to touch on with this function to kind of keep in mind are, of course, the argument for headers, or I should say header, not, not plural. So this is like those other read type functions in R where that if you set header equal true, it'll assume that the first row in the table of data will be corresponding to the column names of that data set. So that's fine if the table online has, you know, in essence, a nice table which has logical headers. But one thing to watch out for that I learned from experience is that some of these HTML tables may actually have a column name that spans multiple columns underneath. You often see this a lot in spreadsheets, for example. Well, sometimes these HTML tables are similar in that fashion. Now, you got to be careful in that situation because if you have header equal true with those kind of tables, then you'll likely get an error saying that it could not import that particular table. And I can't remember the exact error message was, but I noticed that when I set header equal false, I didn't get any problems after that. It took the table as it was and just didn't have any names for the variables. So if you if you notice you're getting errors, you know, you want to check what the table actually looks like online to see if the header is one of those more complicated headers or if it's in fact kind of a simple header to deal with. There are some other useful parameters for a read HTML table such as one to supply column classes. Now that's really useful if you, first of all, know what the type of data are in that table you're, you're trying to import, i.e. you know that certain variables should be considered character, other variables should be numeric, you know, etc. Now the, the other thing to keep in mind is that I told you when I first talked about the function is that by default, it will take all the tables that are on that particular page. Well, here's, here's kind of the catch is that column classes is really addressing one particular table. So what you could do is that if you knew there was only one table you were interested in, then you could just use another argument within the function called which. And what you need for the um, value of that argument is the index of the particular table you're looking for. Now, of course, a lot of times we don't know specifically where 
what index a table will be on a given page. So what you may have to do is just run the function by default to see, first of all, how many tables it takes and then what's the position of the table you're looking for. And then you could always rerun the function again by using the which argument to get that desired index. And then on top of that, to make your life easier from a processing standpoint, just go ahead and use the column classes argument and supply a character vector, of course, with the types of columns that you have for each column. So it could be like a sequence of character, numeric, etc., for however many columns you have. So that was just kind of a, a brief rundown of my experience with the read HTML table function. And like I said, it's a really powerful function and it's really easy to use once you kind of try it out for some example data and get the hang of it. So now let me um, switch to how I went about importing this, this data from hockeyreference.com into my R session. And then after I talk about that, I'll, I'll next talk about how I'm actually storing these data. So first, as I explore the site, I noticed that you know one nice feature they have for the site is that the actual links for like each particular type of table, if you will, had a very logical structure with respect to you know what teams were summarized on that page, may in some cases what year and also what month and what day, you know. Let's say for example, I want the the actual game data from a game that took place on like November 13, 1998, for example. Then what's nice is that the way the links are structured there's actually a nice kind of sequence for how the the date of the month, the day, the year are all put in that actual link. So what that told me is that, you know, what I can do with this is now instead of having to kind of guess what the link would be for each kind of game data I want, I could create, you know, a simple string value that concatenates certain values a month day, year, team, you know, etc., depending on the type of data it is. And what I could do with this is I could construct, you know, a for loop to, in, or in some cases, a series of nested for loops to loop through different possibilities of, say, the different teams that are on the site, the different months that a game is in, the different, different years, the different days, you know, etc., and I could simply, each time going through this loop or a series of loops, make the URL by simply pasting these different quantities together with what I would call the base URL, or in other words, the part of the URL that's not changing from table to table. And that's usually like the first part, you know, followed by a series of some slashes and so forth. So this is kind of a... One thing I want to touch on about R itself with respect to going through things via loops. You know, if you're coming from a programming perspective, you might be assuming that, you know, when you construct a, a loop, such as like a for loop going from, say, index equal one to, say, 100, for example, that you always have to do something via numbers. Well, the nice thing about R is that your for loops, you can loop for just about any type of vector. In fact, you can loop through, say, a character vector. You don't have to map them to like numbers for each, you know, element of that vector. You can simply loop through each element as it is. So this was useful for me because part of my loops that I constructed in my code have to loop through the different team abbreviations. So instead of, you know, mapping an arbitrary numeric vector to those team names and kind of getting the index of that for each um, team name. I just had the vector or team names themselves and just supply that in the first part of the for loop code where it says, say, for parenthesis i in and then say team.vec if team.vec is my vector or team names. So that's just kind of one of the nice things about R is that you can loop through a character vector just as easily as you can loop through a sequence of numbers. So you really have a lot of flexibility from that standpoint. So that was important for me to 
find a way to kind of automate the process of importing these data is to go through, you know, these series of loops from the different combinations of say teams, years, sometimes months and sometimes days. So let me touch on another aspect of this in respect to trying to figure out what are in essence the valid URLs that are possible on the site to get you know certain data. Because if you think about this from just a, a pragmatic perspective, obviously if you're familiar with you know sports in general, you know that in a given day, not every team is going to play. Or in fact, there may be some days that nobody's playing at all, you know, depending on what part of the season you're in. So what, you know, at first as I was building the code to do this, like importing the actual game data, I was basically mapping in essence all possible, you know, year, month, day combinations with the teams, even without like checking them first. But then I realized, well, I might be able to build some code to kind of check whether each URL is actually valid and then make, for example, a data frame that have like each of the various combinations of say team, month, day, and year, etc. And then an, an indicator variable that said whether that, that URL formed by the combination of those various pieces with the base URL actually had any data or not. Because why make a loop that goes through all these, you know, elements of the URL that don't have any data when you could simply find a way to check that first and then, you know, subset your, your in essence, your checked data set to be only the cases where the URLs had actual valid data. So I kind of learned this kind of midway through as I was developing the code, but I did um, go ahead and, and create a script to do this. So I'm not going to read the code verbatim, but I'll point you to my um, GitHub repository called NHL Analysis. And I've uploaded a, a directory within that called Web Scraping. And I'll put a direct link in the show notes to the two code files. I'm just going to give an overview about of how I went about this. So I have one script called urldetector.r. And what this script is supposed to do is it's supposed to do exactly as I said. It was supposed to check for all the different teams and years that could be you know, mapped together. It was supposed to check whether the data associated with that team and year combination was in fact having valid data on the hockeyreference.com site. So I did this a few different ways. First, I was able to get some help from, uh, I believe, stackoverflow.com of someone who wrote, you know, gave me an idea to write a simple function in R to basically figure out if the URL is valid or not. So I called that function URL.checker. And so that's going to be kind of a utility function that I use in the remaining part of the script. And actually, this, this function utilizes the package called rcurl to check whether these URLs are valid. So you might want to install that on your system if you want to mimic this kind of analysis. And then what I did is I simply made a vector of team names that had all the possible teams that could be summarized in the hockey reference site. That ended up being, I believe, about 40 or so teams because... Some of these teams are no longer in existence, but I still want to get their data for when they were, you know, in existence in the NHL. Then I had another vector called years, which was simply, say, a sequence from 1917 to this year, 2012, because I want to go back as far as, <laughs> as when the NHL actually existed, because I, I really want to get that historical data as well. And then I simply formed this new data frame that simply had the all the combinations of teams and years and the way I did that is I utilized a very handy function called expand.grid which all that will do is if you give it say a series of vectors it'll kind of compute I guess what you might call the Cartesian product or basically all the unique combinations of those vectors put together 
So, for example, you had a vector of characters that was like three elements and a vector of another, say, numeric vector of, say, four elements, then you'll get a data frame of 12 rows, simply three times four. So in this case, I got a pretty big data set because I had a whole bunch of years and a whole bunch of teams. And then I put in, you know, empty variables for the different types of team statistic tables that I was going to import from the site. So then I simply constructed my vector or my loops to go for all the different teams, all the different years, and check the URLs, wherever they are actually valid, using my little utility function, and put in the result of that check into this data frame that was gonna hold all the results. So in this case, looking at the team statistic data multiplied by year, that one didn't take very long, you know, maybe about half hour or so, not, not a big deal. It was pretty quick. So then I simply saved that, that actual data set where I had the, the team version of the data frame and the team and year combination of the data frame into a workspace for importing into my next portion of the script to actually get the data itself. So that's one kind of trick I learned is to, you know, if you're not sure about what URLs have valid data, you can simply write your own kind of function in R to check the URL, you know, whether it has anything behind it, and then somehow save the result of that into some kind of object for further processing. So that was kind of a handy trick to do. And then after that, I constructed another script, and this one is called Team Stats URL Grabber. And what this is going to do is first it, you know, loads that that workspace where I had this kind of URL check data. And then all I'm gonna do is simply subset that set to be all the cases where I had a valid team that was summarized in the URLs, i.e. all the teams that actually had data. So once I do that, now I've reduced my data frame to be only the ones that had valid data. Now I go ahead and start building the script to actually take this, the data from those valid URLs into you know, further processing. So once I do that, I simply kind of loop through all this. I, I um, figure out the valid URLs based on what you know, index that data frame has, and then simply use the read HTML table function you know, supplying into it, say, headers that I've defined already, which, because in this case, I always figured, you know, that's actually one thing I want to I go back on, is that the header argument in read HTML table, you know, you could either have true or false, but not only that, you can actually put in it what you want the header to be, which actually, for me, was quite handy, because I renamed the variables to be kind of a little more short, a little more readable, especially with respect to how I analyze these data in the future. So in the, within the script itself, I define character vectors with the actual header, you know, headers that I want for these various tables. And then once I do that, I simply use that vector as the value for the header argument. And then I also, at the same time, supplied into it you know, column classes, because I would look at the table, I would see that, you know, certain variables were integer, certain variables are character, certain variables should be numeric. And I would simply make an additional vector just with those, you know, words of integer, character, etc. And I would supply that as another argument within the read HTML table function called cow classes. And then simply go through this and import the different types of team data for these various tables. And then I would do some other processing of the tables themselves to kind of maybe clean up some variables and actually not only clean up some variables, but also eliminate some rows of the data. Now, why, why am I saying that? Well, the reason I'm saying that is because some of the tables on the site, you would go through a series of rows, say, say 10 or 20 rows of actual data and then the next row would be simply kind of a repeat of the header itself or a subset of that. 
I guess they did that because if a user was like scrolling through the page, they didn't have to always scroll back to the top to see the header. They could always see the header repeated in certain intervals. Now, obviously, I don't want those kind of rows in my data. I just want the actual data itself. So using techniques that I kind of talked about in the previous episode, I would in essence subset the data frame I got to be only those rows that did not have like some weird value for a particular variable because I could tell where the header was repeating there would be a variable called rank or RK and usually that was a number but then when it would repeat the header they would call it RK so I would just simply use kind of the negation sign or the exclamation point in front of my condition to say in essence the name of the data frame and then bracket explanation point then the variable being equal to that weird value of like RK so that way I was going to get rid of those those rows in general and then I was also going to get rid of rows that say had no data at all so that was what you want what you want to do with that is use the um, is.na function which is simply going to compute whether all the the variable observations in a particular variable are missing or not. So you can use that in a subset condition as well. So those are some of the things you may want to watch out for if you're importing data from online is of course eliminate the rows of data that are not actually data and also eliminate any perhaps non-missing rows if there's no reason for those rows to be there. Of course, there are some cases where data is meant to be missing, but in some cases, it's really just simply a blank row, which, you know, doesn't give you anything. So that kind of touches on some of the processing I had to do once I got those HTML tables into the session itself. Now let's talk about how I'm actually going to store this data. I'll tell you what I did at first and then what I ended up doing as kind of a replacement to that. At first, what I was thinking of doing is basically saving or, in essence, binding all the rows of these, say, different teams of data into one data frame. In essence, populating this big data frame with all the different teams and years as I go through the loops of these or in all the rows of the valid data and just basically make this huge data frame and then save it to a workspace or perhaps a series of R workspaces. Now that can be good for say small sets of analysis, but as I realize, there is a lot of data that I'm taking in via these functions. And to be honest, there may be cases where I don't wanna use all the data for my particular analysis. For example, I may in one analysis be only interested in say the early years of the NHL and perhaps the what we call the original six teams i.e. the first six teams that were part of the NHL and quick uh, quick segue here my apologies to those listening but as I'm recording this it sounds like the NHL is on verge of another lockout which the last time this happened there was a whole season that was wiped out and you know, ah, it's just so annoying. Um, I, I've been reading both sides of the fence of what, you know, the owners don't want the players to have as much revenue, et cetera, et cetera. And it's just kind of boggles me how they get to this point. And now there, there's, you know, a serious threat of losing another season because of these uh, disputes and getting a new collective bargaining agreement, you know, established. But Oh, well, I hope they resolve it soon because it was just starting to get near hockey season again. And I was really, you know, always looking forward to seeing the season, how it plays out. But, oh, well, life goes on. Anyway, back to the podcast itself. Um, So back to the subject of storing these data, you know, I realized that perhaps saving all these to workspaces may not be the best approach. But then I thought to myself, well, this sort of sounds like a really good time to talk about, you know, store or even implement storing data via uh, data, like a database. And, and for example, MySQL. So I figured, why not? Let's go ahead and set one of these up. So it's, what I ended up doing is I kind of refer back to some of my bookmarks about using 
the various package in R to deal with databases, in particular the package called R MySQL. I believe I mentioned this in a previous episode just talking about, you know, an introduction to databases with R, but I figured, well, I already have a MySQL server on my home server where I'm actually running R from, you know, why not take advantage of that and create a database for the hockey data? So I ended up doing that. I created a, a, a new data database, you know, within MySQL itself, which there are plenty of tutorials out there if you're curious. It's really not that difficult. And then I went ahead and looked into the documentation of um, R MySQL but actually, on top of the documentation, there were some really nice web uh, tutorials from other, you know, R users that kind of gave the bare bones of interacting with these these uh, databases within R. So I went and up, you know, looking at a couple of those and building my code around that. And I'll put a, a links in the show notes to the tutorials I found really useful for this. And to to give you an idea of what I ended up doing is. I was able to build code such that I would first write a simple if statement to check whether the um, data the data table within that database already existed for that particular type of data. For example, when I was importing the team statistics data, I would there was a table called skater register, which is simply kind of statistics of all the skaters i.e. all the players that are not goalies for each of the teams within the various years. So what I ended up doing is I'm, I utilized a function that within the package called DB exists table, where I would supply into that first the uh, connection to the database where, let me take a step back, when you want to interact with a database in R, you have to first establish the connection to that database using say the database name, the database user, and the database password. And actually, you know, to make sure, of course, I keep, you know, certain things private. I didn't put my script that actually has my username and password in my my uh, server online, but I, I made like a little script to basically connect or define parameters for like my username, my password, and my database name. And you use a function called DB Connect to, um, you know, set up that connection to that particular database. So you'll see the the call to that function in my in my script for scraping the team data and the other types of data. It's very straightforward. You know, just check the check the package documentation if you if you want more details. That's quite easy to get that set up. So anyway, back to this other function to check whether a data table exists. And that, so this function called DB exists table is simply you supply into that your connection and then the name of the table you're checking for. So of course it's going to return simply a true or false to see if that table exists. So what I, the reason I'm doing this is that if it doesn't exist, I want the, the R MySQL package via my functions that I'm writing to go ahead and populate a new table and call it say skater register with the table the table data that I've imported from online as like that first batch of rows going into that new table. Now the reason I'm I did this check is because the function I'm using that to put the data from the R session into the MySQL database is called DB write table. What's really cool about this is that it's like some of the other functions in R where you can, you know, add on top of existing data, whether it's like a text file or something else, it has a, a an argument called append. So of course if you say append equal true, then what it's saying is that it's not going to overwrite the existing table. It's going to add on top of that. This is exactly what I was looking for, is that I want all the different teams, all the different players within these teams to be contained in one specific, you know, MySQL data table within that database and not have to do separate tables for every combination of like team and year and in some cases month and day. I want it all to be in one thing. 
or one table, I should say. So I utilize the append argument to be true if that table already existed. And then if it didn't exist, I would go ahead and just basically create the table from scratch. So this is really you know nice is that now when all when the program actually finishes, now I have in my server my SQL tables corresponding to the different types of hockey data from you know the hockey hockey reference website. So the reason I like this is that first of all, when you interact with a database in R, you only take the data you need and that will be the only part that's loaded into memory. I can actually do some simple queries on the on the table within the database and you know I can think get things like how many rows are there, what are some unique values in the in the columns, etc. But if I put all these in workspaces, you know, when you load a workspace, that whole workspace is loaded into your R's, you know, memory session. And it's been well documented the limitations that some users experience when they load in essence big data into their R session without the use of some additional packages to kind of get around the issue. So for me, loading, putting all this data into a, a MySQL database, now I have the flexibility in that if I'm only interested in certain parts of the data in the database and data tables within that, I can build the simple queries to get that particular type of data out into my R session and hence my memory footprint is going to be you know, in some cases quite small in that situation if I'm not needing the whole entire, you know, data table. So, you know, that approach may not be for everybody, but in the case where I had all these different types of hockey data, it seemed really, really easy for me to put all this into a MySQL table and go ahead and, you know, just take the parts I need when I actually get to kind of some statistical analysis of these type of data. So, in fact, you'll kind of see, I think in this one script I've uploaded, I may have to clean it up a bit because I still have the uh, workspace code in there as well when I was actually assigning these things to different workspaces. So, apparently I didn't, I didn't change everything yet, but I'll, I'll go ahead and update that on the site. But, you know, you ought to kind of see which approach works best for you. Maybe it is good to save all these to the workspace and maybe it's good to save these to a, a database or maybe some other mechanism of storage. So, you know, the nice thing about R is that there's more than one way to do everything and, you know, you just have to find the way that works best for your project. So, but it was really cool to go through this kind of exercise of importing data from online because let's face it, as I touched on at the beginning of the show, this is really common way for people to share data is really through actual web pages. And, you know, if they did, you know, give you like a text file that you could, you know, download yourself. And sometimes you'll just have to find a way to get this data from the page itself into your R session. So again, the packages that were really useful for this were of course the um, XML package for getting the data itself. And then as I mentioned earlier, the R curl package that I was able to build my utility function around to check whether a given URL had actual data within it. So I think that's a great combination to play with in the situation where you have a site like this where thank goodness the URLs are very logical in their structure and I invite you to check it out you know on your on your own if you want to just kind of see how it works just go ahead and kind of click through like the different teams, the different years, etc. Then you'll kind of see a pattern emerge of how the URLs are constructed. So I would I would hope other sites do that too. But when I was kind of looking at other sources of hockey data, there were some sites that you would click on certain types of data, and then you would get this really unwieldy, really complicated URL, like a series of plus signs and, and symbols and stuff, and there's just no way you can understand the logic behind it. But I, I, de I definitely want to give my, give my uh, props, so to speak, to the authors of the hockey reference site for building a really nice and constructive site to import hockey data from. So I hope you guys find that useful. And again, I invite you to check out the code 
that I have in the GitHub repository to kind of see this whole process of how I imported this data from online into, in some cases, the, uh, the MySQL database and just getting the data into the R session in general. So it was, it was really good to get my hands on the data and there's, that, there's some more pieces I need to get, but I'm really looking forward to having all this available to use in future episodes when we get to some really um, cool analysis methods with respect to these type of data. All right, so that's gonna wrap up the main topic for today. Let's now get to our listener feedback. Message for you, son. All right, so we're gonna start the listener feedback with a, a piece of written feedback that comes to us via, of course, our email address of the rcast at gmail.com. This email comes from Andrew. Andrew writes, Eric, firstly, thanks so much for putting together the podcast. Your efforts are invaluable for a relative newcomer to R, like myself. I'm sure the podcast is well regarded by some of the other experts, and an audio medium would be a great opportunity to get some of them on to talk R. Also, like you, I am interested in the use of R for analyzing sports statistics, though, in spite of living in Canada, not hockey. I would be particularly interested if in a future podcast you could cover the interactive use of R with the web. I know that you have mentioned the Knitter slash Markdown slash R Studio Triumvirate, but I am even more keen to know about the actual interactivity so that R graphs and tables could be created on the fly. I use R for a lot for creating blog posts. The sort of thing I mean can be seen from my most recent effort, and I'll put a link to his... Uh, blog post in, in the show notes. He continues to say, here I produced one table, the third one, which relates to a specific team. I would like to be able to have the users have a choice of selecting other teams and have those results show up. Currently, I tend to use Flash for that type of interaction, but the coding is much more complex. If you know of an R equivalent, I and I'm sure many others would be interested. Keep up the good work. Cheers. Well, thanks a lot, Andrew. And uh, first of all, I'm glad you're you know enjoying the show. And I'll touch on some of the points you mentioned. First of which is that you know as I embark on additional seasons of of the R podcast, you know one of the things that other listeners have asked about that I've been wanting to do as well is to get members of the R community you know you know on board for say an interview to be you know played on the show because. First of all, as much as, you know, positive feedback I've gotten, I realize that, you know, hearing my voice all the time might be a little bit tiresome to some of you, but um, I would like to, you know, get some, you know, really, you know, bright members of the community. And I have a list, an unofficial list in my show notes that I keep track of that I'm going to start, you know, sending some messages to and hopefully get some interviews lined up because I think that the audience for this show will really benefit from hearing how other, you know, members of the community go about with their use of R and what they've done to really, you know, extend R for their purpose. So stay tuned for that. I look forward to hopefully having some really exciting interviews in the near future. So the other point I wanted to touch on is, um, you know, your, your touch on your, your point about interactivity with respect to grass and tables. You know, I, I totally agree. I would really like to see this, you know, easily implemented. And one thing that I haven't really found like a very simple way to do it yet, but I have, you know, I have found somebody that's kind of done this from more of a, in essence, a front end perspective of an analysis method that maybe could be extended to what you're looking for when you say you, you can let the user select a certain team or a select, you know, a certain type of data based on a variable value. Um, there's been a, a developer called or named uh, Jerem Ohms, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right, but he's actually developed some really interesting, you know, interfaces for use of, say, certain packages. Now, he's developed one, I believe, to utilize the LME4 package, that's actually for linear mixed effect models, but he's basically developed 
a way for the user to load the data into the web page and then they can basically through a series of you know drop down boxes a series of text fields etc let the user go ahead and run a mixed model and he kind of framed it to be similar to what interface you might have for another statistical package I think of for example SPSS where if you've used that you can when you work on it when you um, select an analysis method say for regression you're prompted for like what's your dependent variable your y variable what are your independent variables what are some of the options you want you go through a series of like clicks of like check boxes drop downs etc or, or you know text fields so I'm wondering if there's a way to extend that kind of methodology to what you know Andrew you're referring to with giving the users you know ways of selecting certain pieces of the data that that they're looking for so I'll put a link in the show notes to Jerem's uh, you know interface for this LME4 package because I think it might it, and you know it's not a direct answer to your question but it might be giving us some ideas of where we could go to you know implement that kind of functionality and you know one thing to keep in mind too is that you mentioned you know the the, the knitter markdown R studio combination and let me first say that you know I mentioned them quite a bit in passing on the show but you can bet that in the next the next season of the R podcast we are finally, and I stress finally because I'm wanting to do this for a while, we're going to dive into using these packages for what I call reproducible analyses because I think of where we're at as a community, you know, or in statistics in general, the time is now to really, you know, bring forth how important reproducible research or reproducible analysis is with respect to, you know, reporting important, you know, data results or how how we analyze certain types of data. Before the technology or the way we would do it was, you know, very, in essence, difficult. But now these packages are making it a heck of a lot easier, easier for people like me, people like you out there to go ahead and start, you know, running some innovative analyses on your own and actually showing the world how you ended up doing it. So, yeah, we, stay tuned for that. I have some really exciting things I want to talk about with respect to those those packages and that, you know, that area in general. So the reason I'm bringing this up is that, you know, I've been, I've been keeping my eyes on what our studio has produced, kind of a sister site, if you will, they call it R Pubs. And what that is, is that now within the R Studio interface, if you have like the knitter package installed, they have like a little button, you know, that you can create let me let me take a step back here. They have functionality in place where if you create what's called an R markdown file, you can go ahead and within one click of the button, create an HTML report out of that R markdown file via the use of the knitter package. And what's nice also is that if you set up a free account on the R pubs website, you can go ahead and upload your report directly to that site. You know, so that you can you can show the world essentially what you what you ended up making for your report. And what I've what I've done lately is I've been checking out the R Pubs website to kind of see how other people are using you know these these types of reports, what kind of analyses they're doing. And I've started bookmarking a whole bunch of them that I think are really polished, really innovative, showing me things that I never knew that R could do before. So. Perhaps as we as we kind of continue to see what users are doing from this reproducible analysis perspective, we might see some ideas of getting, say, this custom kind of interactivity with respect to graphics and um, types of data. I mean, I should say filtering data, like what Andrew's referring to. So, you know, hopefully we'll have some better answers for you in the in the future, Andrew. But for now. Let's see. Let's see what we can do when we look at what Jer Jerome has uh, has uh, developed from his uh, kind of web front end perspective, and also what the fellow user our users are doing with respect to this, these uh, reproducible analyses on rpubs.com. So we'll we'll see where that takes us. But uh, thanks a lot for your question and your positive feedback.
And next, uh, to wrap up the listener feedback segment, I'm happy to present once again our, our uh, devoted listener, Franz, who has his second segment of the uh, Pitfalls of R. So let's go ahead and have a listen. First of all, Eric, uh, congratulations, of course, to you and your wife with the birth of your son, and uh, kudos for still finding time to uh, do the R podcast. This is pitfall segment number two. I had uh, promised another pitfall about dates, but I decided to do something different instead. This segment is about the difference in using R interactively and using R for scripting. It's also about different types of parameters. R has a lot of useful functions, and uh, most of these functions have parameters. Uh, when you call a function, you supply values for these parameters. Now R has many different forms of parameters, and let's examine two of these, positional parameters and named parameters. With positional parameters, the order in which you supply values to a function determine for which parameter each value is used. With named parameters, the order or position does not matter. Instead, you name each parameter together with the value you want to give it. Parameters of both kinds sometimes come with default values, which means that if you don't provide a value for that parameter, this default value is used instead. Let's use the function runif as an example. That's uh, R-U-N-I-F. Uh, it might be pronounced differently, but I like to call it runif. Runif generates random numbers with a uniform distribution. It takes up to three parameters. The first parameter tells how many numbers you want to generate. The second one gives the lower limit and the third one gives the upper limit. So saying runoff 100,0,1 generates 100 random numbers between 0 and 1. Now the second and third parameter have default values, which are 0 and 1. So I can leave out the second and third parameter and just say runoff 100 to generate 100 random numbers between 0 and 1. Now in both cases I used positional parameters. The order in which I supplied the 100, the 0 and 1 determined to what parameter the values were given. Now the three parameters of runoff also have names. The first one is called n, the second one is called mine, and the third one is called max. If I wanted to use named parameters to generate 100 numbers between 1 and 6, I can say runf n equals 100, comma, mine equals 1, and max equals 6. You can even mix named and positional parameters. For instance, runf 100, comma, mine is 1, comma, max is 6. Or even, and that might be a bit surprising, run if mine equals 1, comma, max equals 6, comma, 100. Here, 100, the value for n, is listed at the end. But since the other parameters are named, it is the first positional parameter. Now, of course, named parameters require more typing. Positional parameters save typing. Default values also save typing, and sometimes even save thinking, which makes them very handy when you're using R interactively to examine some data. It is, however, very easy to make mistakes with these type of parameters. It is easy to assume that because one function has a parameter in a particular position, a similar function will have the same parameter in the same position. I fell in such a trap and uh, for a detailed example see the posting it is good to be explicit on the pitfalls of us blog. When using R interactively these mistakes can be fairly obvious since you immediately see the result of your step. 
but if you use R for scripting to make a data analysis repeatable, mistakes of this kind can be less obvious. Especially if your script is longer, or you tinker with it a lot, or you use functions with a lot of parameters. For a script, named parameters work much better. Also, it is a good idea to explicitly write out the values you use, even if parameters have default values. They make it clear what you mean. They make that clear to R, to others, and most important, to your future self. I'm always amazed how difficult it is to understand code I wrote a few weeks ago. That might of course be because of my coding qualities, but remember, you will read code many more times than you write it. So two tips to avoid this pitfall. One, when you use R interactively and then turn the steps you found to do some smart data analysis into a script, take some extra time to name your parameters and make your defaults explicit. And two, if you use RStudio, use the tab key and use it a lot. That tab key is mighty handy. It will show you the parameters of the function and fills in the names for you. It will even show the default values, so you can copy them. I must say that uh, I'm not really an IDE kind of guy, I'm more inclined to for using VI, but uh, since Eric pointed me to RStudio, uh, I must say I'm very very happy with RStudio. Um, this, all, this was pitfall segment number two, and uh, I hope you uh, found it useful. See you uh, next time, or better, talk to you next time. All right, Franz. Well, thank you again so much for a really nice segment, and um, I really value your participation in the podcast. And actually, Franz has been kind enough to send a, a couple of plugs of the R podcast on some of the recent uh, statistics online courses that have been offered via the new site called Coursera.com. And uh, for those interested, I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. But what's nice about that is that they're basically offering free courses, you know, what you might think of college courses, but they're offering them for free for the whole world. They have courses on what I mentioned already, statistics. They have some other courses around science and, you know, social sciences, etc. But I'm really interested to see where this, where these uh, statistic courses lead to, because that could be really interesting to see how these uh this this kind of new wave of technology with respect to sharing you know these these uh, important materials of these courses with via these online you know mediums I, i'll be really interesting to see where this goes so um, i'm just kind of an observer right now but i'm, I'm really kind of digging the whole idea so we'll, we'll see where that takes us but anyway um i think that's I'd actually put a wrap to episode 10 here so I'll, I'll kind of leave with um, a new uh, talk about a new enhancement to the website itself. You'll see that if you go to the the website called r-podcast.org, I've updated the uh, contact page. If you go ahead and check that out, now you'll see that I have an actual form on there where all you have to do is basically fill out, you know, your name and 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 just put in kind of your message. And you can go ahead and send feedback to, to the show directly from that page itself. So probably something I should have put on in the beginning, but, you know, better late than never. So you have that as an option to provide your feedback. You also have the, the other methods that have been in place for a while, first of which is via email at um, thercast at gmail.com. We also have our Google Plus page where you can find a direct link on, on the R podcast site um, on the right hand side go ahead and leave a comment to the episode on, on that as well we also have our online forums at r-podcast.org slash forums and we've had you know we've had a few listeners contribute to that and hopefully we get some new participation in the future and also if you're interested in leaving an audio comment like what Franz has been doing for our 
past couple episodes, go ahead and record, you know, a short audio clip and go ahead and pass it on to the rcast at gmail.com. Or you can also use our Google uh, voicemail hotline. And the number is plus one two six nine eight four nine nine seven eight zero. You can also subscribe to our Twitter uh, feed to get uh, show updates. We are on Twitter with at the RCast. And I believe that about does it. Um, like I said, I just um, want to take this time again to thank everybody for listening with this uh, first season of the R Podcast. And it's certainly been an, an interesting but really fun journey to get to this point. And I'm really excited to see where the future takes uh, takes us with respect to the additional content that I have planned for season two, which hopefully will be here very soon. So with that, that's going to wrap up episode 10 of the R Podcast. Thanks a lot for listening. And until next time. End of line.